Chris Rock slaps Will Smith back in his latest comedy special. We'll look at Will Smith's actions and reflect on them and ask, is that what real manhood looks like? Or is that more part of the problem with modern day manhood, that it has been incredibly feminized? Well, we'll look at the feminization of culture through things like our permissive criminal justice system, how soft on crime, George Soros funded DAs are part of the problem. And then we'll also look at the feminization of the church and how the modern day message of some churches is actually wreaking havoc in many places in society. And then finally, As a result of the new Tennessee law to ban drag shows for minors, there are some in the mainstream media who want to clap back and suggest that people don't really regret their gender transition. Well, we'll look at the facts. We'll look at that and more today on Indie Thinker. Our show today is sponsored by our friends over at Anchor. Maybe you're feeling right now the pressure of doing your own taxes, quite bothersome. And you know that eventually you're going to have to file your business taxes too, and you don't want to mess with all that, and you want to make sure you're in compliance with the man then you need to go to our friends over at Anchor. They can help you with that and so much more. Maybe you haven't even started a business yet, but you realize you can't wait for those people and the government to get their act together before you finally realize that you need to take your financial future in your own hands and you can do that by generating your own wealth by creating a business. Well, not only do you want to make sure you're in compliance when tax season comes along, but you need to help with accounting and payroll and staffing and so much more. Our friends at Anchor can help you with all of that. They're pros, they're experts, and they care about the things that you care about. So it's a business you want to support, but you got to make sure you get the name right. Go to ancur.biz today. And when you do so, let let them know that Andy Thinker sent you. Welcome to the show. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. We have a special show planned for you today. Um, and by special, I mean we're looking at a special that Chris Rock just recently did. Now, his Netflix special is already getting rave reviews, and the viral moment, especially that's catching people's attention, is near the end of the special where Chris Rock finally addresses what took place between him and Will Smith and the slap heard around the internet, or some say the slap heard around the world. And um, he, he looks back on this in a, in a way that I think is, is really important. So I want to show it for you here. So check this out. Everybody in here have been cheated on. None of us have ever been interviewed by the person that cheated on us on television. None of us. She hurt him way more than he hurt me. Okay? Okay? There's no doubt in anybody's mind that what unfolded that night is exactly as Chris Rock explained. See, the fight was not between Will and Chris. The fight was between Jada and Will, and Chris Rock just happened to be caught in the middle. Will Smith was laughing until he turned his eyes toward Jada and saw the side eye his woman was giving him. And then at that moment, Will changed his demeanor and then promptly walked on the stage and slapped Chris Rock in the face. So not only is this ridiculous because Will Smith was acting fragile that day, but it's also ridiculous because Will Smith was being led by his woman that day. Now, this is a woman that's already emasculated and defenestrated Will Smith publicly when she announced that she was cheating on him and then demoralized him one step further by making him have an interview about that very fact and what was going on in the relationship at the time. Will Smith and Jada's relationship became the the stuff of internet legends, of, of internet meme legend where single men would would post out there, hey, one day I want a woman, I just don't want the kind of woman that Will Smith has. And of course, Will Smith is reeling from this, and because he didn't want to be demoralized even further, reacted the way that he did. But in a lot of ways, the way Will Smith reacted is a parable of sorts, an illustration for the modern man, because we are living in a culture that is consistently being led by women, and as a result, our culture is being feminized. Now, you may ask, what do you mean by feminized culture? Well, here's what I mean. From the youngest age, young boys who behave a little bit more wild than young girls because they are boys at the end of the day, we prescribe ADHD medicine and Ritalin and shove it down the throats of these young boys rather than prescribing actual fathers and homes helping these boys with their behavior. And then once we've 
made these boys docile enough to be controlled, then we throw them into sports where they're supposed to be able to use their energy and, and use it in a productive manner. And because we've subdued them with drugs, we then instead put participation trophies in their hand instead of actually helping them create real achievement. And then if, if that's not enough, once they finally come of age and they're able to become the best of the best, our armed services, our military, we subject them to the greatest training possible. We make sure to give them diversity, equity, and inclusion for whatever battle lay ahead so that they can make sure not to misgender anyone, which would be the worst thing you could possibly do. And if all of that is a little overblown in your eyes, I hope we can all at least see at this point in time that we have come from a patriarchal society to a largely matriarchal society. Not only is the single parenthood rate in America higher than anywhere else in the world by a long shot, the vast majority of those homes are not just led by a single parent, they're led by a single mom. And then even when men are present in the home, very often they're absent. So a woman can help a young child become a boy, but a man can help a boy become a man. A mom really can't do that. And we need men to step in and, and, and participate in society, in homes, in order for the feminization of culture to be, to be corrected. But very often that's not happening. And so what do I mean by the feminization of culture? I mean, ultimately, that we've adopted a principle of allowing our feelings to dictate our emotions. It's something called emotivism. Now, before I define emotivism, let me just say that this is exactly what Will Smith did. If he was thinking like a man rather than being controlled by a woman, he would have thought that what he did that day does it didn't need to happen that he wouldn't have allowed his feelings to dictate his actions that day but he was operating under under the principle of emotivism and i am saying that the principle of emotivism is something that comes more naturally to women so let me explain it so that i can defend it emotivism is essentially an ethical theory that regards um, ethical values and judgments as expressions of feelings or attitudes and perceptions of action. So in other words, rather than logical and rational assertions, we make assertions based upon our feelings. Now, that certainly seems to be what's happening at the Oscars and in other places in our culture today, that our culture is being feminized because we are using feelings rather than reason. Now, you may ask the question, Reed, does that mean that, that women aren't rational at all and that they don't use reason at all? No, that's not the argument. The argument is that a gender binary exists, that a sexual biological binary exists. Men are more inclined toward rational thought and women are more inclined in toward, toward emotive thought. This used to be common understanding before the feminist movement of the 60s and 70s and so much more has brought us into the present where now we feel like we have to make excuses for that which is overtly obvious, that men are more inclined, not always, but more inclined toward rational thought, and women, not always, but are more inclined toward emotional thought. Now, some of you women are amending this because finally we find somebody who is willing to speak the truth about this very obvious fact so that you women no longer have to have the pressure upon you of being the rational people in the relationship where men can finally step up and be men in the relationship because they're standing in, in their role. And so very often the roles are flip-flop today. And, and again, that's what we saw with the Will Smith slap heard around the world. And we're seeing it all over the place. And I'm going to use my stories today to kind of, to, to kind of illustrate this. But let's just say that what we're seeing in the present is a total flip-flopping of what we see in the Bible. We see that pathos or feeling is replacing logos in so much of what is going on in culture today. So in other words, feeling is replacing truth. And so we would rather feel comfortable than the truth, than to have the truth. Now, this is what I'm going to be talking about on Thursday with everything that we've been hearing about COVID and the lab leak theory and all of that stuff. I'm going to give a full kind of explanation of what's going on with that on Thursday. But suffice to say, we see in the COVID issue, we see a group of people who wanted the comfort of trusting their media to do their thinking for them 
And we saw a group of people who said, it is very clear that the media is lying to us and cannot be trusted. The reason there was a group of people who desired comfort rather than truth is because comfort is easier. It feels nice, but it is also because our culture is slowly but surely being feminized. The reason I bring this up is that the vast majority of people who want to say, calm down with the culture war stuff, and let's not worry about what's going on all around us. Let's just focus on the Bible. Uh, those of uh, those who would say, oh, you're overreacting when you say the Marxists are coming, the Marxists are coming, come on, get over all of that stuff. Well, we may be overreacting, but when we hear organizations like Black Lives Matter come out and say we want to destroy the nuclear family, when we hear that critical race theory, which is descended from critical theory in the Frankfurt School, which was a bunch of socialist um, that wanted to revolutionize the United States. And when we hear things like abolish the police, um, and, and what they mean by that is we want to overthrow and dismantle and completely replace core institutions that make up the capitalist state. When we hear all of those things, is it really weird that we would say, we need to wage culture war right now because there is a Marxist inclination that wants to destroy our society. And if we care about this society, this society that has been responsible for more money being sent around the world to help others, especially more Christian dollars going to help spread charity and goodwill by mission, Christian missionaries throughout the rest of the world than any other civilization in human history, if we actually care about this society, then we might want to pay attention because there is an aspect of the culture war that we need to start focusing on because if there is a way to destroy society and institutions, it is through the feminization of culture. In fact, it is a primary tool for dismantling Western culture. And by the way, I only know one cure for it, which is why we as Christians need to pay attention if indeed you are one. Uh, and that is that we need institutions that are patriarchal in nature if we're going to undermine the feminization of culture. And there is a book that is patriarchal in nature that can help us with that called the Bible. And this is one of the reasons that in the public square, the Bible has been pushed away so often and told and we're told that it's totally irrelevant to us today because there is an agenda to try to push aside biblical truth and to try to paint it as evil and then call it patriarchal as though the patriarch as though the patriarchy was innately and inherently evil but of course that's not true the bible paints a different picture of patriarchy that i would like to try to reclaim for each and every one of us today if i possibly can the bible shows god as a father a loving, nurturing, guiding force in the world to those who look to him. And the Bible paints the picture of Jesus as a man. Now, why doesn't it say God the mother or show Jesus as a woman? The reason Jesus came as a man and the reason God is a father is that if we are going to relate to God in a way that is best representative as to who God is, then we must do, throw, do so through masculine principles or more masculine ideas. Because the Bible is patriarchal for a good reason. Because God is a father and Jesus is a man. All that to say this, if we are experiencing feminization in culture, we desperately need a return to patriarchy in order to help us truly understand the benefits and the value of patriarchy rather than accepting what we've been told about it all along. And here's one of the things that we definitely get from the Bible when we look at true biblical manhood. We see that Jesus was both a lion and a lamb. He was a lamb and that he was humble, he was willing to serve, and he talked about love, but he was also willing to taper those inclinations with the other side of him, which balanced this loving nature of God and made it full and complete, which is with the nature of a lion, where he was fierce, he was tenacious. He was able to, to gently but honestly confront issues in his day in a way that was perfectly balanced. See, the nature of a lion and a lamb is clearly illustrated in scripture and desperately needed today. But if I am to be honest, from my experience in ministry and traveling around the world in ministry, I would tell you that, yeah, we could do with a lot of lamb nature. But if there's anything that we're sorely lacking today, it's the nature of a lion. We need courage. We need men to stand up and be men. We need men to do what they were created to do rather than to be led around by women. Because in the process, the feminization of culture is an very dangerous thing that needs to be confronted. And I'll show you why in our top stories today.
while we can go to one extreme or another, it is clear that we are in the present going to an extreme of feminizing the criminal justice system. And because we are now permissive when it comes to to those who break laws, we are, we are creating victims rather than helping victims because of our permissive nature in the criminal justice system today. And this was reported to us just recently in St. Louis, where a man named Daniel Riley was out on bond, out on bond for armed robbery, and had already violated the conditions of his bond numerous times. And he was let out on bond and allowed to violate this bond numerous times by a George Soros-funded circuit judge named Kim Gardner. Now, this Kim Gardner has a pretty interesting history that whenever she has been criticized, she would jump immediately to claiming that it is because she's black and not because she's actually not doing her job well. Well, just recently, this Daniel Riley out on bond for armed robbery after violating his bond multiple times and should have been in prison, this man got into a car accident where he failed to yield at a yield sign, ran directly into a car uh, that was carrying a young girl from Tennessee, and he rammed into the car so hard that the young girl had to have both of her legs amputated. Now, this young girl was a volleyball player and she had a scholarship to a school and was about to go to this school very, very soon. And she was actually on her way to visit and in the process had gotten this car accident. And as I said, both of her legs were amputated simply because this man that should have been in jail was out gallivanting around and driving without a license. Now, the more permissive we become with our laws, the more victims we actually create. And by the way, the victims are not just the people who are having their legs amputated because a circuit judge won't do her job. It is also the criminals here who desperately need to to learn from their past actions and we in the present are so utopianist, don't realize that the only way that some people will learn is when they feel the repercussions in the weight of their crime, when they are punished for their crime. Now, this has been widely reported and what is happening in Portland. Two years into drug reform laws that are trying to fight against that Nixon war on drugs, two years into this drug reform, Portland is absolutely devou being devoured by drug addiction and drug use out in the public city streets. So a recent measure, uh, Measure 110 in Portland, was implemented, and what Measure 110 essentially did was it took what they would call petty drug use and petty, petty drug possession and basically made it a traffic violation. And so now you can get a citation if you're in the middle of smoking fentanyl on the street and the citation is a $100 fine that can easily be waived if you make a phone call to a uh, addiction recovery line or something like that. Uh, but, but in the process... This permissive drug law taking shape in Portland is starting to destroy the fabric of that already hemorrhaging society. So here's just a small clip of this drug reform law in action in Portland. Portland, Oregon, two years after decriminalizing personal amounts of hard drugs. The open drug use, the deaths worse than ever. Where are we here now? Uh, this is Skidmore Fountain. Um, which has been called Fentanyl Fountain by some of the folks that we've interacted with. Police officer David Bayer patrols downtown. Measure 110, the ballot initiative that brought in decriminalization, changed his job. See this guy right here? Yeah. Yeah, watch this. What's he doing? He is probably smoking fentanyl. See that? Yeah. And we're like, you know, we're in what's basically a police car. It's unmarked, but like, we're pretty obviously the police. Hi there, put that knife away, please. What are you smoking? Fetty. Okay, just yeah. powder fentanyl? Yeah. Is that what you drop right there? Yeah. Right there? Yeah. Can you pick that up so someone else doesn't find it or a kid doesn't find that, please? Under Measure 110, Bayer writes a $100 ticket. The fine will be waived if this man phones a treatment hotline. Now, for those of you who are listening and not watching, you just saw a man smoking fentanyl on the street, throwing it down on the ground. The cop had to ask him to pick it up so that there weren't any kids that came by and grabbed it. And then he was given a citation and then allowed to continue to smoke his fentanyl. Now, the reason this is truly an issue is that 
is that, you know, forget defunding the police for a moment, push that to the side. What we've actually done through permissive laws is we've neutered the police so that they don't have any ability to actually functionally fight crime in the city streets. So, so yeah, we can, we can talk all about the problems of defunding the police, and we will in just a moment, but essentially these kind of laws that are permissive when it comes to egregious acts of drug use right in our city streets, right before the face of cops, is, is an effective way of defunding the police without defunding the police. And it's a story that we're not talking about very much today. But why defund the police in the first place? Why be so permissive when it comes to policing in our city streets, especially in places that desperately need more cops, not less? Well, of course, I think we know. The reason you would defund the police is that the police are one of the few stop gaps for those who want to revolutionize society. For those who want to try to dismantle society piece by piece, they need to do so as unobstructed as possible. So these weaklings who know that, uh, that they actually do not have the physical force to actually create revolution want to do so in a maniacal and diabolical way. And the way that they do that is by trying to defenestrate and to try to demoralize the police in our public cities. And so this, of course, is nothing less than an opportunity to try to dismantle and recreate our society in a vision that looks more like the Communist Manifesto than it actually does reality. See, this is why the permissive nature of our criminal justice reform is, is actually a serious problem. If we have an issue in the criminal justice system, especially today, it is not that the wrong people are accused and then sent to jail. You know, this making a murderer kind of conspiracy theory that the left has, although they don't call it a conspiracy theory, they just call it justice, um, that, that by and large, the vast majority of people who are in prison don't deserve to be there and should be let out on the street. This conspiracy theory is actually very, very dangerous, not only because it lets criminals out on the street, but also because it slowly but surely dismantles our society and allows for the few things that keep order in our society to actually be kept in place. Permissive criminal justice reform is nothing less than an opportunity to feminize and weaken our culture so that we are more easily duped and subdued. This is what this is all about. By the way, this is why more and more fathers are being, um, being removed from homes or being told that they are unnecessary in homes. Because when you take a father out of the home, the one who was supposed to protect is no longer there to, to protect, and kids are much more vulnerable now. Uh, no wonder you're seeing an uptick in, in these kind of targeted uh, drag queen shows and transgender story hour and drag queen story hour, especially aimed at children. Remove fathers from the home, and then you have the only stopgap and the only protection that kids have against some of these maniacal things in our society. And perhaps that's exactly what's going on in our next story. And that is that the church is starting to see some feminization too, especially in the messaging that we are putting across. Now, I'm going to show you a clip from a young man who was obviously trying to create controversy and trying to build up followers on his YouTube channel. But I'm going to show you this because he's, yes, at a Unitarian Universalist church, which, by the way, are always pastored by women without fail. Every single Universalist Unitarian church in America, especially led by a woman. There's a reason for that. We'll get to it in a moment. But uh, but so, yes, he's at a her heretical church that really isn't even a church. He's at this heretical building that teaches heretical things. Um, but but I, I want you to, to listen to some eerie similarities to many things that we're saying in the modern day church, especially in Protestant evangelical settings that you will see in this video. So here is a young man building up his YouTube channel, but doing so while revealing a mainstream message that we need to be focused on. So here it is. Welcome back to a brand new YouTube video, guys. Today, we're at a gay church in my hometown, Cookville, Tennessee. And uh, all donations are going to gay pride. So we're going to go in, hear the sermon, and then try and ask questions. Make sure you leave a like, comment, share. Thank you guys for all the support lately. Continue sh uh, sharing and su subscribing. Support my work. Let's get into the video. Nice to meet you. My name's Bo. Nice to meet you. What's your name, Bo? Bo, nice to meet you. My name's Marie. Good Would to you meet mind you. if I just ask you a couple of questions? Sure, sure. Sure. So, what do you like believe as a Christian? Are you biblically born again? But we interpret how what Jesus actually meant, not what's been misinterpreted. And what do you think has been misinterpreted? Well, he never said, you miserable sinners. <laughs> you know, he said, know the truth. 
and the truth will set you free. And the truth is that we're all a part of the same Christ consciousness. So Christ wasn't his last name. Mm -hmm. It's the Christ in all of us, and we're all part of the one body. So does this church follow the basic biblical teachings? Um, well, we just interpret them differently than mm -hmm. you do probably. I don't know. How do you interpret them? Well, I'm just asking you because yeah, okay. I'm just interested in the church and sure, what you guys believe. Sure. Well, the reason I ask is we allow, I'm here to support you on mm -hmm. your spiritual journey. Right. So I teach what we believe and you can accept mm -hmm. whatever you want. I'm just here to support you. But I believe we're all one. All one. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't care who you are. I don't care what race, color, creed, what religion you practice. Mm -hmm. We are all one in the body. So do you believe that other religions like Islam, Judaism, do you think yeah, that they could also right go to heaven? Yeah. They could also go to here. heaven? They're all part of God. She's oh. pushing me. This is a pastor pushing me out of her own church. I'm, I'm going to leave if you ask me to leave. But I'm just saying, she, she invited me into the room. What happened to love and acceptance? What happened to love and acceptance? No. I'm not afraid of anyone. I will leave. I just don't understand. You guys preach love and acceptance. You're going into your own sermon right now. This is the kind of feminized Jesus that is being preached by um, certainly the Unitarian Universalist Church, but also a more feminized version of Christianity in the present. See, throughout all of the, the video here where basically nothing is truly accomplished outside of this one thing, is that the message of tolerance is exposed here as a unbiblical message. See, the message of tolerance is the message from the Unitarian Universalist side of the heretical community. Um, kindness is a message of the Christian scripture, but not tolerance. The message of tolerance will always end in hypocrisy as it did in this video. This is such a, a good representation of that because while these people want to talk about tolerance and I appreciate your views, why don't you appreciate mine? They eventually will show you how intolerant they are. So this is the intolerant, tolerant left once again coming after everybody that disagrees with them. They are tolerant of your views as long as you ag agree with theirs. But the moment you disagree, well then the pushing and the shoving and the yelling and the removing comes out. This was on full display, by the way, when Mash Wal Matt Walsh just recently made comments about Dylan Mulvaney, the tolerant left and the loving left and the bleeding heart liberal who is so quick to, sit, to care for marginalized communities, of course, unless they are white and in Palestine, Ohio. Uh, that, that, uh, that group of people were so quick to be completely intolerant to Matt Walsh and his views of Dylan Mulvaney. In fact, they were quick to, to say things like, your hate is unforgivable, you lifeless, soulless cretin. Oh, so much for tolerance. 10-4, no hate, we got it. Yeah, so so much for your little message of tolerance. It's, it's a completely hip hypocritical message and it will always end in hypocrisy because it's not a true message. See, we're not supposed to tolerate everything. We're not supposed to be tolerant of kids being abused by adults. We're not supposed to be tolerant of, of adults who think that children should have uh, cabaret shows done at the earliest of ages right in front of their face where men in lingerie should be and, and thongs at that should be doing splits in front of children and, and providing a not only provocative but disgusting view of what manhood actually is in front of these children. So... So yes, that, that is the kind of tolerance that is espoused on the left. And we're not supposed to be tolerant of everything. We're supposed to be tolerant of minor disagreements. We are supposed to fight tooth and nail against evil. See, it's an important question because most people today would rather be thought loving by the people in society, but actually be doing cruel and evil things or sitting back while cruel and even evil things are taking place. But in the meantime, you are thought loving. You get to get your likes on social media and you never have to stand against anything controversial whatsoever. But in the meantime, you're absolutely being cruel. So this is why I agree with Dennis Prager, who I just had the privilege of being able to do uh, a, a brief interview with, and uh, you'll see that coming shortly. You need to be subscribed to the newsletter to get that fully. But, but this is why I agree with his statement, clarity above agreement. See, we don't want to constantly go seeking out fights, sure, 
But we don't also want false unity where there is not unity, where none should exist. So what we want, especially in a communication with somebody that disagrees with us, is we want clarity. We want to ask their position. We want them to for- fully formulate their position in a thoughtful manner, and then we want them to, to display it. Whether we agree with it or not comes only after clarity is given. And the clarity that comes from the message of tolerance is one of hypocrisy and one of permissiveness. And it is a way in which the church is being feminized in the present, and we need to take a step back, re-envision what the Bible actually says, not necessarily through a masculine lens, but, but recognizing that, as I argued at the beginning, that there is a masculine lens already placed on top of the scripture for us to lead us towards a masculine interpretation of scripture. Why? Because that's what God wants us to associate him with, those kind of masculine aspects. That's why he came as a father and why he came as a man. See, if we do that, we'll get closer not only to biblical truth, but we'll get closer to the thing that actually built this society into the great country it is. Now, we're still a great country. Now, I get accused of this from time to time because I rail against what's going on in society. Read, we're the greatest country on the planet. We have unparalleled prosperity. Listen, I, I know, but I want to keep it. And that's why I continue to try to call us back to conserve principles from the past, namely a a masculine interpretation of Jesus so that we can understand Jesus as he meant us to understand him. Not masculine culturally speaking, but masculine biblically speaking. And if we don't, the church will continually be feminized and weakened as a result of it just like our men are consistently being weakened in the present. And when I say in this last story um, that men are being feminized, I mean literally. Just recently in Tennessee, we passed some laws. We passed a law to ban uh, gender mutilation in children, and we passed a law to ban drag shows for children. Now, I can proudly say that I had a small role and standing up and letting my voice be heard, not only in city council meetings, but outside of some of these events, um, protesting against what was happening. And now we've seen a complete role reversal, how the tables have turned when we take just a little bit of effort and time out of our schedule to stand up for things that matter. And now the police that were once trying to keep concerned citizens out of local businesses are now keeping people from abusing children in those businesses. So, see, before, children were being abused while cops were focusing on concerned citizens, and now those cops get to focus their attention on the children that are being abused. And now our society is all the better for it. But in the process of that, there's been some outcry from the mainstream media and, and especially from, uh, from the LGBTQ community saying all of the statistics that you're hearing about gender-affirming care in minors is, is a big lie and that actually only 1% of people actually regret their gender transition. So let's look at this article from uh, Yahoo Lifestyle. In updated treatment guidelines issued last year, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health said evidence of later regret is scant, but that patients should be told about the possibility during psychological counseling. Now, already we have a big problem here. The people who are being cited in this article are from the Professional Association for Transgender Health. Now, I have to just be honest here and kind of lay my cards on the table. If it was from the Journal for American Medicine, JAMA, or from even the uh, Pediatric Association of America, what it, it wouldn't matter because these places have all been bought out by big pharma and bought out by um, a leftist ideology anyway. But suffice to say, starting the article with the Professional Association of Transgender Health as though that was actually a professional thing. It sounds professional, but as though that we we were supposed to be able to find like objective evidence from these people that is total nonsense. But the article will go on nonetheless and say, Dutch research from several years ago found no evidence of regret in transgender adults. No evidence, right? Who had comprehensive psychological evaluations in childhood before undergoing puberty blockers and hormone treatments? Some studies suggest that rates of regret have declined over the years as patient selection and treatment methods have improved. In a review of 27 studies involving almost 8,000 teens and adults who had transgender surgeries, mostly in Europe, the U.S., and Canada, 1% on average expressed regret. All right, so there you have it. There's the numbers from this this article here, and this is actually from the AP, and Yahoo is 
kind of recording it. But anyway, in this article, it, it says that only 1% of people in the U.S. and Canada, from teens to adults, expressed any regret whatsoever. Boy, that's a incredible low level of regret. But what you should know as you peer a little bit deeper into this study is that it was kind of done so in the form of, let's say, an undergraduate paper that would have gotten an F because they say in most studies. Okay, like what studies? See, this is a dead giveaway for those of us who want to join the indie thinking community and think for ourselves. Whenever somebody says most studies, rest assured that they are either lying or obscuring. And there's a good reason they're saying what studies here because they don't want to actually assert what study they are citing. Because when you actually dig into the study, it's it's kind of murky. Now, again, let me just be clear. I'm going to assume, based upon the evidence they present here, that the study they're referring to is the one that I'm about to throw up on the screen, uh, which is by the which is cited by the NIH and on the NIH website. It sure seems to cite the same kind of statistics. I don't know for sure because it's not actually cited in the article, but I'm going to assume, based upon the evidence presented, that this is what they're actually trying to convey is the 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 citations and the results of this study. So I, a couple things to note about this study. This study is done so with a bunch of ton which with a ton of missing data of surgeries, how old the people were when they had surgeries, how long ago the surgeries were, and and all that. There's no baseline in terms of the types of procedures that are cited either. That's just kind of all over the board. It's this wild hodgepodge of just basically everything that they can throw into one study. Furthermore, there's no acknowledgement of the fact that people are really less likely to speak against their their transgender surgery and expressing regret because they know that there is a social cost for doing so. So in other words, this whole study is a mess. It's really, really unreliable. A way more reliable study would come from PLOS, which is the Public Library of Science, which is a peer-reviewed medical journal, all right? Unlike this NIH study, this was peer-reviewed, and this study found this. Persons with transsexualism after sex reassignment have considerably higher risk for mortality, suicidal behavior, and psychiatric morbidity than the general population. Our findings suggest that sex reassignment, although alleviating gender dysphoria, may not suffice as treatment for transsexualism and should inspire improved psychiatric and somatic care after sex reassignment for this patient group. And by the way, just in case that that's not convincing to you, let me show you this study from the NIH themselves about cancer surgery and people who are trying to alleviate cancer symptoms. This study found that 14.4% of patients regretted their surgery for cancer. So, so we're supposed to believe that people who are taking elective pl whole body plastic surgery only regret that 1% of the time. I mean, have you seen some of the people in Hollywood and the plastic surgery they get on their faces? You know somebody, you have a friend who got plastic surgery on their nose or on their face or something like that. And you're like, you looked better before the plastic surgery friend. So, so, so we're supposed to believe with that reality in mind that 14% of cancer patients are, are, are people who regret surgery, but only 1% of transgender patients regret surgery. Can somebody say lie much? So, so the point is just this, that right now in the present, we are literally feminizing men by taking men and turning them into women. I know we're doing the reverse as well in turning women into men. And regardless of if that you know, shakes out numerically in the end, it doesn't matter because the point is, is that women are not men and men are not women. And men trying to be women are an incredible issue for our society today. I mean, just look at what it's doing to media alone. The new Mario Brothers movie should have been something that we all rejoiced in seeing, except for the fact that the roles have been totally reversed in this new Mario movie. Although Chris Pratt will star as Mario and probably be a good uh, lead actor in the film, or at least voice actor in the film, we, we are going to have to be subjected to the wokeism of Hollywood by the fact that Luigi now is the one that's been captured because he's too weak to protect himself, and the princess has to come along 
to help this bumbling, fumbling idiot Mario get through all of the perils and dangers of this Super Mario world in order to go save his very weak and, and submissive brother. No! Ah, get it off, get it off, get it off! <laughs> so again, here we have the hero woman and the stupid men who can't help themselves. And this is what we're supposed to believe. How idiotic to, that, that Hollywood thinks that we actually believe women are stronger physically than men. It's ridiculous. We're hosted to things like the Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power, which should have been a spiritual wonderland of deep, meaningful messages rather than the most stupid thing you've ever seen in your life because you constantly see a blonde-haired, fragile woman going around beating up men. We all know better. Fortunately, we have the past to look to, and I know this is kind of a dorky example, but forgive my nerdiness for just a moment. I started watching The Walking Dead on Netflix, not because I like zombies at all. I actually hate the gore of that show and actually rather look toward the kind of human drama of the show because it's actually very interesting. Because in the process of writing the show, it constantly comes back to some universal truths that it can't help but illustrate in the midst of an apocalyptic setting, where we understand that so much of the things that we think are important. When those things are stripped away, we find what's really important. And that's what Walking Dead, Dead does uh, pretty successfully in, in places in the show. And where I'm at in the show, they did this just recently as they're trying to present the idea that it's better to die on your feet than to live on your knees as the whole Negan thing is going along. And the guys are starting to realize that you can't live your life as a, as a slave, that it's not a tenable way for living, living life. Give me liberty or give me death, in other words, is kind of what's what's going on in 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 the show. And the lead character in the show gives a great parable that I think is worth listening to, or at least entertaining. He says this, that there's a rock in the road, and many people have tried to avoid the rock. Um, it's caused wagon wheels to bust apart. It's caused people to break legs. It's caused a number of issues as people have just tried to avoid this rock rather than dealing with the rock. But finally, a little girl goes and she digs until her hands bleeds until she finally gets the rock out. And when she does, she realizes that underneath it was a bag of gold. And she's all the better because she was willing to address the issue rather than to try to avoid it. And so in the present, we find that the feminization of culture is, is aiming at the very thing that we need more. It's trying to eliminate those who would address the issues that are plaguing society and the people who are most likely to address those issues. It is trying to weaken them. Those men who have an obligation to say, young lady, you won't dig that rock out for me. Please allow me. It's better my hands bleed than yours. Those men are becoming rarer and, and becoming something that we need to get back to as quickly as possible. And as a cultural apologist and as a Christian, I think, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, one of the ways that we can do that is by getting back to an understanding of the true masculine, by getting back to an understanding of who God actually is. As you embark upon that journey, I wish you the best, because we can't continue to pretend as though the rock doesn't exist. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. But most importantly, go with God.